everybody. Welcome back. It's the Basic Architect. Yeah, we are continuing on with our series here. This is the Passive House 11 series. Here's a quick picture of that uh, Passive House. This house here, if you haven't been following along, I designed it in 2009. We built it in 2010 and it actually got certified in 2011. Yeah, 13 years ago. Um, we completed certification on this house and it became one of the first passive houses um, in the country. It's located in climate zone five. It's up here in New England, um, down on the water in Cape. It's about a 2,000 square foot video. Like I said, we're on, I believe, I believe it's episode 13. So if, you, if this is the first time you're catching up with it, I suggest go watch the other 12 episodes. Um, I'm trying to give you kind of the complete picture of uh, what we did here and most importantly, why we did it, right? It's uh, a lot of information gets passed on in social media in terms of, hey, this is what we did. It's not really important what you did. It's important why you did it, right? I need to understand what were the parameters um, that defined those decisions and why did we do that? And that's what we're here to talk about today. Because if you understand the why, <clears throat> then you can potentially adjust that information to your why, right? And the, the reality too is, is that as a, as a young architect, we concentrate on doing what? We don't concentrate on doing why. And the why is probably the most important thing of anything we do, right? The reason we actually do it. Like, yeah, okay, we design a house because you want a living room and you want, a, you know, a family room and it's three bedrooms and, you know, you sit there with clients. Oh, yeah, I want a three, three bedroom, two and a half bath, a media room downstairs, three car garage. But the real question is why? Do you have three cars? Or do you just want extra space? Do you put a ping pong table out there for the kids? Maybe we put that in a basement and not do a three car garage. What what is what is the why there, right? Understanding the why generates sound decision making. So, anyways, we're here to talk about the why. What are we going to talk about today? Well, we got a really good topic. If you've watched episode twelve, we talked about our air sealing strategy. Um, at the second floor lid, basically the ceiling of the second floor. And I went through a bunch of the whys and how we did it and the steps that uh, derived that, that um, the answers to that. But today we're going to talk about, we have our zip sheathing on the wall and that's our primary air barrier. And if you watch the last video, we go up and we use the ceiling drywall as our drywall or as our ceiling air barrier, or the sixth side of the box. And the question then becomes, how do I solve for that? Right? Why do I need it? Well, I need it because, you know what I'm going to say, we need to provide continuity. Right? And you have to remember, Passive House, we committed to the client that we were going to be at point um, six zero ACH 50, right? So we have an air tightness requirement. We have to hit on this house. We're contract contractually liable for meeting that 0 0.60, the builder and myself. So I have to come up with a strategy along with the builder. And then we have the builder has to execute that strategy to basically hit the 0 0.60. We did. Um, we were at uh, 0 0.5657, something like that. Second video, all the numbers to this project, go check it out, um, has everything defined there. But um, we're going to talk a little bit about that detail. So, a quick look at the second floor. What we're basically talking about is if we are going to use this as our ceiling strategy and all of the drywall we didn't and like I said go watch number 12 we didn't put any of the walls in we basically put this all up as one continuous air barrier 
And the reality is, is that drywall was about 12 inches in because we had a double wall assembly and our zip primary air barrier is out here along the exterior wall. So somehow we have to connect this to that in that 12 inches and then take it across and then again we'll be with that barrier of 12 inches and in how we make that connection. So, this was uh, the shot. We also used this one in the last video. This is just showing our ability to eliminate the scuttle with a conversation to the building inspector and the fire marshal to understand that we'll put our attic access on the outside. And we've done that on subsequent buildings um, in different jurisdictions. We've never been told no yet. So, um, they all find it... Uh, you know, working with us to be a favorable condition. So we're, again, we're talking about what is this detail in here, right? How do we come up the wall and go across the top of the wall? Because we know we're using drywall as our air barrier to the inside, but I have to make that connection. And so let's take a look at that. Um, I'm going to blow this up here to a nice big size. Here is our drywall, all right? We know we're gonna connect that there. And that's just basically half inch gypsum board. And then we know on the outside here, we have our zip. Right. Now, the question becomes, How do I connect this to that, right? Now, keep in mind, along the way, we have a 2x6 outside wall. See our double top light there? It's a double wall structure, so we have our 2x4 wall inside there. And, you know, I believe we're at something like 12 or 14 inches, something like that. doesn't matter. I mean, one or the other. Um, so we also needed to provide if fire gets in here, we need to provide a stop for fire that gets inside that uh, double stud wall cavity and um, stop it from connecting to the attic and continuing to burn there. So we know we had to put closure there. The other thing about this is, is the fact that in New England, we use ceiling strapping and the dimensions of the ceiling strapping are typically one by three. So they're three quarters of an inch by um, two and a half inches. <coughs> and we put those at 16 inches on center. It's just a, it's a common construction method that we use here. Um, I think it dates back to, you know, straightening out some of the old uh, solid sawn timbers and stuff and ceilings. Electricians like it because it gives them a little gap to uh, staple up some wires running in the attic and et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is, is we have our ceiling strapping and we've found a way that that can help us and aid us in this detail. So we know we have a three quarter inch face that we have to deal with. And so our ceiling is furred down three quarters of an inch. So. So the solution here is, why don't we cut a piece of three-quarter inch? In this case here, we just used Advantech, which was what we used for the flooring. But it's basically three-quarter inch OSB. So the three-quarter inch Advantech. And that three-quarter inch Advantech, it does a number of things. You can see it connects the outside wall via a bead of sealant to the inside wall via a bead of sealant. It stops that fire from continuing and provides um, a code approved closure on that cavity space. And if I extend this four inches here, then what I've gotten now is a flange that I can bring my drywall over 
and connect to that three quarter inch. I can also come out here and I can tape that joint. Right? And then subsequently I would tape all of the butt joints and seal the butt joints of that because it comes in eight foot length. So every 96 inches, we're going to have a butt joint that we need to seal up there. But if we play along or sing along with my zip boards connected to the tape, the tape's connected to the Advantech, the Advantech's sealed to the walls, the Advantech is sealed to the drywall, drywall goes across the ceiling, and there's a mirrored version of this detail then we've successfully, yeah, you know, I'm going to write this big because it matters. And I know you guys, you're sitting there saying, okay, Steve, enough. You talk about continuity all the damn time, right? Yeah, I do. You want to know why I talk about continuity? Because I travel the country every year. I jump fences, climb fences, walk through projects, and I see discontinuity all the time. It's real easy. I'm either in or I'm out. It is really that easy, right? There is a line in a building, and I am either inside the condition space or I am not. I am out. But you know what? Well over half the buildings I go into, the answer isn't in or out. It's maybe. Maybe so. Am I in or out? Well, I don't know. Maybe so. Maybe I'm a little in. Maybe I'm a little out in that space. No! No! In or out. Continuity is the key. We get continuity here. Right? We get continuity in the fact that I come up my zip. I come across here with tape. I come across here. And I extend that flange. And then I extend... My drywall. Look at that is Joe's red line test coming to you live. Right? All the different components connect, they maintain continuity across that detail, and they put our house in a position for success. The success in such that we hit 0.57 on our air tightness. Let's take a look at a few photos that support what's happening here. Oh, this here I wanted to just point out. One of the things about these drawings that I learned, notice on here there is no soffit, there's no fascia, there's no metal drip edge, no reference to the roof, none of that stuff. Why? Because this is an eave detail designed and drawn just for the framers. For the framers to install the frame and maintain continuity and get a proper air barrier, right? All the other stuff, crown molding, soffits, metal roof, drip edge, none of that has to do with the air barrier. So I don't want to muddy the waters for the framer. So I do what I call a set of twins. We have this detail and we have this detail. They're exactly the same detail. They just have different notes on them. And this one, notice... This one has the soffit. This one has the crown molding, has the trim, shows the window, has our subfascia and fascia, and our metal roof up here, has little truss plates, all that good stuff. But it doesn't call out all of the air barrier stuff. So the framer uses the previous drawing, and when the framer's done, everybody that comes after him, the cider and the roofer, they use this drawing. For me as the architect, I only drew this detail once. This is just manipulating the notes on different layers to get what I call a set of twins. Alright. So, let's take a look at, here's that detail. Here is that, this is our 2x6 wall here on the outside. That's our double plate. There, and you can see it continues across here, right? Here is that three-quarter inch Advantec. This is that area of flange, right? And that's where 
You can see our strapping there. That's where that drywall is going to connect. Now, what you're not seeing is the interior wall hasn't been framed yet. This is the plate for that 2x4 inner wall. This is all the uh, double stud wall cavity, but you can see we have our proper fire blocking there. We have our flange there so our drywall can come in and we can run a hefty bead or beads of sealant along there and then we can simply attach our drywall to it and we get, you know, that continuity across that system. And here you can see it in near completion where we have our drywall and we didn't draw we didn't build any of the interior partitions or closets we had our drywaller come in like i said go watch the uh, previous episode episode 12 i believe air barrier strategies where we'll talk about that in depth there so i'll leave you to uh go and watch that video but yes we installed all of the drywall without doing any of the interior partitions on this project and then that allowed us to get that continuity across that plane in both directions. Right? So that's that Eve detail. That's how we solve for it. That's why we did the things that we did. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Anyways, stay tuned. We still got a lot more to talk about on this project. Uh, hopefully you're having fun. I'm having fun. Um, yeah, that is our roof Eve detail. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Until next time, long live our build.